good morning, good evening, or good day to everyone here. Thank you very much for uh, taking some time out of your day to come and listen to me talk about the state of identity management in OpenSUSE and SUSE Links Enterprise. Um, first up, uh, who am I? So, you know, SUSE has had a lot of new staff and I may or may not have had the pleasure of meeting many of you as we're all around the world. Uh, my name is William Brown. I'm a senior software engineer here at SUSE Labs. Uh, I work uh, on my day job on 389 directory server, which is the uh, primary LDAP server that we supply here at SUSE for our customers. Um, but I also work on a few other things as well. Um, I, I take care of Rust. Uh, I've been working on WebAuthn and I've been uh, interacting with that stand script for a while. I've uh, been working on CunyDM, which I've previously given talks about. And the reason why you may or may not have had a lot of interaction with me is because I am on the other side of the planet. I am uh, from Queensland, Australia, which means that often while you are all happily having dinner or enjoying a morning coffee, I am probably in bed or you know, working or something like that. So I, I'm a bit on the other side. So uh, because of this and my time zone being UTC plus 10, the best way to get in contact with me after this talk uh, or for anyone who is watching the recording is to send me an email at wbrown.suze.de. So I've previously spoken about this, um, about identity management, because it is, you know, my my job and my focus to care a lot about security and how people log in and, and how we actually provide that to ourselves and to other people. And no, it's not a mistake. I haven't just locked my laptop. Um, this is a slide. Uh, and, and that's the thing is that, you know, every single one of us is so used to seeing a screen that looks something like this, where we have a username and a password presented to us. Um, and Every day we authenticate to so many of our devices, like, you know, our, our phones have our fingerprint reader potentially or uh, a PIN or a password. Um, you know, our laptops have our passwords as well. Um, and those laptops might have SSH keys and things. And we use, we use authentication because we want to control and understand who has access to what resources. So say on my laptop I have my personal financial documents and I may not want my next door neighbors going through that. Uh, so that's why I have a password on my machine. The same way that you probably have uh, uh, something on your phone so that if you ever lose it, people can't go through the content of your phone. Um, so these, you know, this fundamental property of authentication is that it's about controlling who has access to what. And, and then because of that, we need to know who you are. And this extends to like so many different things. And especially for us at SUSE, um, this really extends to servers and services that we may provide or that our customers may be deploying and using in their environments. And so, you know, here within SUSE, say a very important piece of authentication and security would be how people are authenticating to something like the open build service, um, and that then grants people different privileges to be able to accept and release packages going out. And that obviously has a lot of security implications uh, as to, um, you know, whether code is released out to the thousands of people who rely on us to um, give them software. And of course, if this security, this identity management, and then subsequently the authorization going through, if this wasn't occurring uh, or, or was somehow compromised, then that would represent a really major issue for us. So within SUSE um, and our corporate offerings, but also our open source offerings through OpenSUSE, we offer a number of different things uh, when it comes to identity management. And, and just as a bit of a um, refresher, of what those, you know, what forms those things can take. We're going to go through that quickly. So part of, you know, one way that we can look at this is that SUSE is the client of an authentication system. Uh, and this could be SUSE Linux Enterprise or it could be an open SUSE machine. And we rely on an external service or that 
computer that is running our software, sorry, relies on an external service and um, uses that to make identity and authorization decisions. Within SUSE Linux Enterprise today, uh, I was about to say the words we support, but I think we support, please don't take this as a legally binding statement of actually supporting. Um, I think we support Active Directory, which is um, done through the Samba team's work. Uh, we also support LDAP and Kerberos clients, uh, as clients, sorry, to authenticate to generic LDAP and Kerberos services. Um, we have had some uh, within OpenSUSE, however, we support all of these plus some extras. We have um, the ability to work with Red Hat's identity management uh, system, also known as FreeRPA, and OpenSUSE can act as a client in those environments. And we also have the ability to act as a Cunning DM client, um, thank, you know, due to my work because it's my project. In the reverse, though, we also have the ability for SUSE to offer identity management services uh, to clients and what form those clients may take could be quite different. So as our identity management offerings go, today we really offer um, mainly 389 directory server as a generic LDAP server, um, which has been the kind of tried and tested method of Unix authentication for a long time. And we also offer the ability to run MIT Kerberos as a um, KDC as well, which is another method of authentication that can exist. Within the open source community, though, the community supports OpenLDAP, which is a, another OpenLDAP server, and they support that as, um, as a server and the client, but that's externally driven by the community. There's also been a community effort to add free IPA as a server. And um, 389 is obviously as well on OpenSUSE as well, and that's mainly driven by us here at SUSE. There's been some interest lately in the Ypsilon project, which is a Python uh, web authentication system for um, doing web-based single sign-on. And that provides things like SAML and OAuth. Um, and I, I think that might have been packaged and is in OpenSUSE now. I'm not, I'd need to double check, sorry. Um, and, you know, finally, as mentioned, we also have the ability to run as a kind of VM server. And the final thing that we also have on all of our machines really is local authentication, where you as a person will just authenticate to one machine. So this today is still generally limited to passwords only uh, within uh, most Linux distributions. But there may be some customized setups which have uh, fingerprint readers or um, other similar things. Um, but generally, when it comes to, say, servers um, and how we authenticate to a remote server, uh, SSH keys really seems to be the, the number one way that people authenticate themselves to remote systems. So with, a, with that bit of a um, background as to the different roles that um, SUSE can have, you know, what's been happening in the last year. So first up, I want to actually uh, call out the really excellent work of someone in my team, um, which is David Mulder, and what he has done in terms of getting SUSE to act as a Active Directory um, client, but also for doing automatic certificate enrollment is really freaking cool. Um, what this mean, like, what this allows is that a open SUSE or a, a sorry a SLE server can authenticate to Active Directory, but then automatically enroll itself to get certificates similar to something like Let's Encrypt, um, and automatically deploy those both for user certificates and server um, certificates as well. And this is really awesome. Uh, it's one of those things where it opens up a lot of really interesting possibilities for consumers of SLE, especially given the wide prevalence of Active Directory in business environments. Having further integration with that and that as a, you know, such a broad, broadly used identity system, having better integration with that and being able to more seamlessly get and deploy cryptographic material is really awesome. Um, and I'd honestly say that probably the, the work of the Samba team has made 
the Active Directory integration for SUSE Linux Enterprise is probably, you know, one of the best that, that's probably around. So something else that's changed this year that's that's really interesting and going to have some very interesting effects on not just SUSE, but other distributions like Debian and CentOS and Red Hat as well, is the changes that have happened in the OpenLDAP upstream project. So OpenLDAP have, uh, they released version 2.4 about 14 or 15 years ago, right? And they've been supporting 2.4 with lots of different updates and patch revisions and, uh, and all of that for the last 14 years. But earlier this year, they released 2.5. And later this year or early next, they plan to release 2.6. And the thing is that the uh, developers of OpenLDAP as an upstream community have stated that as a community, they only plan to support version N minus one, which means that the moment 2.6 comes out, they will no longer be looking at um, any issues in 2.4, both as a client and server libraries. So this is a bit of a challenge because OpenLDAP really does have a monopoly on uh, LDAP client libraries. Almost every time you use an LDAP client library, at some point it'll be calling to libLDAP underneath. And between 2.4 and 2.5, uh, there are some potentially breaking changes between those things. And similar with 2.5 to 2.6. Um, there's already been some work, um, thankfully from you know, the 3819, uh, who also share an interest in, you know, supporting 2.5, but also, you know, potentially having to support 2.4 after it's gone end of life upstream that, you know, will end up kind of having to take over some of this responsibility in some ways. Um, but it really does uh, put us in a bit of an awkward, awkward spot as a um, distribution. And it means that, you know, we have to basically main, you know, potentially do some extra work to, to maintain this. Um, and if the OpenLDAP project continues with this, you know, very uh, fast and aggressive release cycle, it's potentially going to make it really hard for um, some of the more, say, community distributions like Debian to, uh, you know, have, have painless upgrades. Because if the OpenLDAP client libraries are changing frequently and there's so many things that rely on that, this moving piece is going to potentially cause lots of disruption uh, within quite a few spaces. So it's going to be really interesting, I think, in the next few, you know, year or two to see how that ends up going um, within within the OpenLDAP client space. Uh, a second ago, I touched on the fact that the FreeIPA, there was an effort to put FreeIPA server into OpenSUSE. Um, the reality is that today is that while this was going on for a bit, it's mostly stopped. Uh, FreeIPA is really large, really complicated, and, and it has a lot of dependencies. And so this effort has pretty well um, stopped. The FreeIPA client support is still there and still building and still working, um, but it's pretty hard to see FreeIPA's um, server components really being brought up successfully on OpenSUSE, let alone the, the maintenance effort to, to keep it going um, once that initial bring up is complete. 389 server in both SUSE Linux Enterprise and OpenSUSE has had a lot of improvements this year. Um, one of the really major ones is that we have gained the ability to automatically migrate from OpenLDAP to 389. Uh, and this is really uh, great for our customers because it takes what was previously a really difficult and challenging technical process and takes a lot of those really gnarly parts out um, such as, you know, schema, data migration, and a bit of the config stuff, and really simplifies that, uh, which is going to help a lot of people move over much more cleanly and, and seamlessly onto 389. Um, we can even, we even actually wrote support into 389 to understand all of the same uh, database hash formats as OpenLDAP had, which means that people who use, who migrate, won't even need to get 
you know, users to reset passwords or, or change anything or do anything esoteric. It will just move over and keep working. There's still some manual steps that are going to be required here, um, but we do provide a lot of um, checklists and support guides and things like that, which will really help people actually move over in this process. Since we have this migration tooling now, uh, we can finish completing the removal of OpenLDAP server from Slate. We'll still need to provide the OpenLDAP client libraries because so many things depend on it, but uh, we will be able to complete removing OpenLDAP server. Um, and especially this is going to have impact on our customers who currently use OpenLDAP as their servers, but we think that they'll end up in a better position overall once they've moved over to 389 and they'll end up with a, a better experience, we think. There's also been a pretty interesting effort in um, 389 recently to remove BDB or the Berkeley database in, in favor of um, something else. And this is because between version five to six, uh, Berkeley database changed from the Sleepy Cat license to AGPR3 or commercial. And of course, this caused a lot of issues with distributors. Um, because the AGPL, I, I think, has has a number of um, challenges with uh, license compliance, and so for a lot of us, you know, for a lot of you know things, this means practically we've lost the ability to get updates to BDB. So, the way that most people handle this kind of problem um, when they're presented with a license compliance issue like this is instead of trying to become compliant with the license they just end up using something else instead, which is exactly what we're doing here. So we are swapping to MDB or LMDB, which is um, developed by the OpenLDAP project. Um, and there's a number of other options that could have been chosen um, and other projects that were previously using BDB, such as NSS, they're swapping to SQLite, things like that. Um, but one of the other things is that, you know, LMDB is potentially faster than BDB. Um, and so there's a lot of interest from certain groups in 389's performance improving uh, by swapping to LMDB. Uh, and so, you know, not only is this uh, helping to get us onto something that hopefully will be supported for a longer period, but it also means that we're having a renewed interest in improving our performance tooling and benchmarking and, and some of the things that we're doing in 389 there. I think one of the future goals that I'd like to um, follow up though and, and to, to get moving forward would be really interesting to get 389 out of the distribution base completely and have it just as an application container. Um, it would really help just in terms of updates and testing and consistency by only having a single method to manage this as an application. Um, it would also really help us because it means that we aren't going to end up in a position with 389 in a long-term supported state uh, for you know 10 years potentially. Even you know though 389 is developed by us at SUSE and and others, and has a really uh, strong enterprise focus in terms of our our um, support cycles. It's still not something where we want to end up having to work on you know eight-year-old code potentially. Um, and so having that um, ability to move at a different pace to the base system uh, does seem to be something that there's a lot of interest in from different groups. And I think that it would, you know, 389 is actually a really good candidate uh, as an application that could, um, you know, uh, sorry, words are difficult. 389 could be a really good candidate as an application that could be containerized so that it can move at a different pace to the base system. So William, we have one question on the chat. Yep. Yep. Can an open LDAP client talk to a 389 directory server? And conversely, can a 389 DS client talk to an open LDAP server? I'm unfamiliar with the ecosystem. So um, LDAP is a protocol which defines like how the servers talk to each other. So the open LDAP client 
can talk to any LDAP server. It can talk to the Open LDAP server. It could talk to Active Directory's LDAP server. It could talk with the 389 LDAP server. It's, you know, there's a single protocol between them. So the Open LDAP client tools are the kind of universal client tools within open source, and they can talk to every LDAP server. So sw us swapping from Open LDAP server to 389 server, all the Open LDAP clients and things like that will still keep working. The main change is really just how you administer your LDAP server, how you know you manage replication and things like that. Um, so, so that would be the answer to that. In the second question, which was about 389 as a client, 389 is the server components only. We still require the open LDAP client parts to allow applications to do those client bits to talk to a server regardless of what it is. So I hope that answers that that question for you. There's also a remark from Hannes. I'm yep. not sure whether he wants to get us some more details on that. Yes, if possible. Yep. No, that's uh, regard regarding your comment to move things into containers and just serve uh, deal with as containers. Yeah. Um, sure. This does uh, this does apply to. Every actually every application we distribute with with Sleep mm. because we do have the very same problem with well literally every single application we have on Sleep. Yep. Um, and well, there are benefits surely, but there are also downsides. Namely, if you have an up if you have an um, an issue with your update, you mm -hmm. affect every single installation. Whereas with the um, with the Sleep model. Where you just update, it, it put it, put out individual updates for well selected uh, versions only, and um, you're yep. somewhat limited that one. And but then um, main point being is that this that maybe we should hold this in a broader um, broad, hold this discussion in a broader context, like the mm. Neo context, where it really would make sense to think of whether we could change the distribution model of Sleep and what is actually part of the of the Sleep package and what not. Yeah, and well, and I think that part of that is that, um, as you touched on, that you know, because we, you know, if we had three eight nine going out in multiple different leap streams, and we botched an update on one stream, then we're going to affect, you know, only a percentage of our customers who are using that. Let's say that I tomorrow botched an update for three eight nine in you know service pack three, if fifteen service pack three, um, but that wouldn't affect anyone on SP two, for example. Um, so yeah, we would be in a way, you know, removing a source of isolation. But part of this we also have to remember is that when we're talking about our customers, is that it's very likely they won't be on mixed versions. So one customer probably won't be mixing Service Pack one, two, and three in their LDAP um, server topology. They'll be using all SP three. So when um, an update like this that would is go an assumption out, which I can't really share. Uh, that, and that's customers. fine, but within the LDAP environment, it is an assumption that we can make because we do ask that people keep within a certain set of versions for replication. Um, and so in that environment, if someone updated their machine, you know, part of it is not just about, um, you know, the uh, what you're saying where we would only affect one customer versus another. Well, we're still going to affect that customer, like, and and those customers need to have processes in place anyway, like testing through staging and upgrading, and going through their own QA processes as they release those updates out. And even then, um, something like LDAP, which can have um, multiple active servers in a topology, you know, you would do a staggered update. You wouldn't, you know, YOLO reboot the entire, you know, cluster of four or eight servers at once. You would do one at a time. And then, you know, often a good system administrator would also have derived their rollback plans. Um, and of course, in containers, the rollback plan would be back down one version of the container. So ensure that you have the downgrade process tested. Um, and that downgrade process can differ depending on the application in question and what that is going to be. Um, so there's all of these other things that I think system administrators and our consumers are already having to do because they're already probably on a reasonably homogenous 
you know, set of sleeve versions. And so like the difference between, oh, we pushed out an update to a container and, oh, we pushed out an update to Slee and that update was broken, you know, our customers are still going to have to take those same administration methodologies in terms of, um, you know, testing, rollback, you know, all of those messy parts about administration. And, you know, they still need to apply it to both scenarios. So I think that, you know, especially within that production level context, I think that container versus package is a, you know, in terms of isolating breakage is probably not as big of a deal. Um, definitely, I could see that there are, you know, absolutely pros and cons of packages and containers in other areas, but I don't think, to me, that would be one, um, especially, you know, having been a system administrator for seven years before I did this job. <laughs> so I've had, had to do my time in the trenches. So that was a bit of fun. Um, but I think, yeah, as you said, it's probably a much larger discussion. So um, yes. yeah. That was my my key point is that, I mean, yeah. it's not just OpenL, but it's basically it's every larger installation, whatever, Tomcat, Apache, you name it, yeah. which all Absolutely. have the same problem and which for which all we all run into the same problem. So yeah. uh, I'd rather have it at, at in a larger context yeah, preferably yeah. the legal discussion, which we think we will have yeah. later. Yeah. Um, so, all right, continuing on then, though that was a very good question. I did say I would answer questions during the talk. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, uh, we have a quick remark from Dirk. In an ideal case, customers wouldn't have to do their own QA on updates that SUSE provides with us now. That, that's, that doesn't exist. Every customer has to QA because it doesn't matter how good our QA teams are, customer environments are always going to be different to what we expect and we can't QA what a customer is going to be doing. Every customer should have their own QA because they're gonna be doing something weird and that is site specific and they would absolutely have to have their own QA. Like no one just YOLO updates into prod. And if they do, they have a lot to answer for. <laughs> anyway, so continuing on. Um, so my favorite auth project, uh, CunnyDM. We have had a lot of improvements, but something that I was really excited about this year is that we ran a Google Summer of Code project with two students. And we did that through the OpenSUSE um, organization as our um, organizing body. And, you know, many thanks to the OpenSUSE Google Summer of Code um, organizers. I think it was Doug, I think it's the name. I'm, I'm just really bad with names, so I apologize. Um, but the, both of those students have done really well. Uh, one of them created their first set of open source libraries, which are now published on Crates.io. And they allow OpenSSL to be used in more asynchronous networking contexts for Rust applications. And this is already being used in Cunny and a couple of other um, projects as well. And the other one developed a uh, logging library which integrates with the Rust tracing framework. And it's uh, fully asynchronous. It allows high performance timing, measurement, debug logging, and a whole bunch of really cool stuff. And they did a really great job. They, they did almost all of the work to replace it. It was just that at the end, they ran out of time just to do the the elbow grease work of changing out the old log library with the, the new one, um, which we've since finished off. And so that's now uh, in production as well. And so they both did really great. Um, and again, you know, it was fantastic to have that support from the OpenSUSE project to be able to offer this as a project. And as I said, we've had lots of updates as well. Um, we've now got working OAuth 2, um, where we can do web single sign-on. There's still a lot more improvements to come in this space, such as OIDC uh, or uh, OpenID Connect. And there's already some people in the community trying it out and using it. Um, another contributor has already started to look into SAML support for other enterprise application integrations, um, which has unfortunately hit a couple of roadblocks because of complexities of XML signing, which throwing back to what I was talking about with David Mulder earlier, uh, he would know all about because that's involved and it's not a fun topic. Um, but there's been lots of other features. Like since I gave a talk on Cunny last year at uh, SUSE Labs conference, you know, this is the things that we've done. We've got 
MFA recovery codes, performance improvements, security improvements. You know, we had the a query optimizer in our um, server before, but now it's based on statistical analysis of the indexes to work out which one is actually going to give you the best um, uh, results. Uh, you know, new logging system. We've got more load testing um, benchmarks and comparison. Um, web Authn on command line and web interface. You know, foundations of a web UI and support for um, YubiKey backed. So these guys, um, YubiKey backed SSH keys. We support the SK ECDSA keys storage and distribution now, which is really cool. Um, so just as a quick demo of OAuth and how it works um, within Kani as um, and so at home, I wrote my own light bulb controller because I have way too many projects, as many of you would also understand. Um, and so if you know, if I enter in the light bulb controller URL here, go to it, it'll take me to the Cunny DM site, enter in my username, I'm prompted to use my WebAuthn security key, and I interact with that, and then it asks if I want to proceed to log in. And there, I'm on my um, light bulb controller. And I think something that you know many of you keenly would have spotted is that I didn't enter a password here. This is just using WebAuthn for authentication. So purely cryptographic authentication over uh, the web, uh, which I'm really excited about. So the current remaining barriers to adoption is probably the need to improve the self-service portal a lot more um, and to have replication implemented for high availability. Um, already had some discussions with some other people about what would be required to really get this over the line to make it a candidate as an identity platform for a business to use. So I think um, in the last year, we've, there's been a lot of different types of improvements, like lots of polish across the, the board, you know, migrations, um, different things, um, some improvements in open source and things like that. But, you know, Security and authentication really underpins so much of what we do as um, as a business. You know, our, our systems need to be secured and that all ties back into identity management and security at some point. And, and I think it's definitely, you know, worth thinking about, you know, what are we doing in the future for identity management here at SUSE and OpenSUSE? There's currently uh, work to improve our internal identity management infrastructure. And there's a lot of really good people involved in that process, but also just looking at, you know, now that we've uh, working a lot more with Rancher and integration with things like Kubernetes, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we need to think about how identity management uh, ties in with the various applications and services that we offer and provide to our customers in our community. But it's also really important always to look at what the world is doing. I will probably never stop harping on about um, web authentic and cryptographic authentication as I really think it's the future. But I think what's really important here is that there's a very small company called Microsoft who is starting to roll out that their employees, especially on their identity management and security teams, uh, don't have passwords. They're just using web Authn with cryptographic authentication only. And this is really big. Um, that's, you know, they're also pushing that their customers and consumers through things like Azure AD have more access to cryptographic authentication and tying in with devices like these YubiKeys for pins or fingerprint readers or face ID and things like that. Um, you know, the world is starting to move away from passwords where we're potentially finally going to see it in our lifetime, which is really exciting. It's also really interesting to see what Apple is doing for their consumers um, because they're also improving and expanding their integrations of cryptographic authentication in their devices. You know, every device has now had Touch ID or Face ID with a secure enclave attached for many years now, but they're also enabling it so that um, when you have your laptop and you've enrolled your Touch ID on that, that when you pick up your phone, you can then start to use your phone's touch ID as well for the same website without having to enroll the phone separately so that you get this single sign-on between your devices. Um, for us at SUSE, given a lot of our surface area, especially when it comes to server infrastructure is SSH, 
Um, it'll be really awesome to potentially improve our documentation and guides around using things like hardware backed SSH keys. So again, um, things like YubiKeys with the SKEC DSA and SKED25519 types, um, but also just how SSH key management can be improved. Um, I think for a long time, it's not really been a, a, a super exciting topic and it's been delegated out to other things. Um, but it'll be really interesting to see improvements in the SSH CA space uh, for dynamic key generation enrollment. Um, but, you know, I think the other thing is also just how about desktop Linux? You know, our, our laptops as, uh, or, you know, for many employees here at SUSE, you know, what kinds of authentication could exist for desktop Linux in the future as well? Um, so, yeah. Uh, I hope this has been interesting. Again, I'm, I am I do want to quickly say thank you again for all taking time out of your day to uh, listen to this. Uh, I, I hope that it was enjoyable. It's been a, a bit of a fun couple of weeks for me personally, so I, I'm glad that I was actually able to complete the talk and still give it. Um, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the rest of the event. And if there are any questions, now is your time. The only thing I'm seeing on the chat is some remark on QA still. Yeah, yeah so uh, for anyone on the recording who might be curious about the, the extra QA details, people are talking about how, you know, we, we can't actually QA test everything. We can try as, as much as we want. We can get, like, performance benchmarking, things like that. But, you know, customer behaviours and applications and deployments are always going to be you know, unique to them. And so they'll always need to layer their own QA and testing on top.